Welcome to Smarter Markets, a free weekly podcast featuring stories from the entrepreneurs and icons of commodities, capital markets, and technology, ranting on the inadequacies of our systems and riffing on ideas for how to solve them. Together, we explore the questions, is capitalism in crisis, and will building smarter markets be the antidote? And now, here's your host, Eric Townsend. Welcome to the seventh episode of Smarter Markets, a weekly podcast that explores how financial markets could be redesigned and improved to better serve market participants and society as a whole. Smarter Markets is made possible by a grant from Abex Technologies. I'm your host, Eric Townsend. A theme we've heard from several Smarter Markets guests is that Singapore is going to play a critical role in modernizing financial markets. And when I interviewed hedge fund manager Kyle Bass in my Macro Voices podcast, Kyle even went so far as to say that Singapore will replace Hong Kong as the premier financial gateway city between Asia and the West. This led several listeners to express curiosity about Singapore's government and legal system. Kyle Bass told our listeners that having an English-language contract law legal system is absolutely essential for building a global financial center. So does Singapore have one? And how friendly is their government generally toward entrepreneurs from the West? And what about entrepreneurs who propose to throw out the old way of doing business and redesign how financial markets themselves work? Is the Singaporean government ready to work with outside-the-box thinkers who want to propose a whole new way of doing things? We set out to find a guest who could really speak with authority to these subjects. Frank Levin has worked in finance in Asia for decades and served as the United States ambassador to Singapore from 2001 through 2005, so he knows the Singaporean government and its financial regulator, the MAS, from the inside out. Frank joins me as this week's guest to explore the question of how suitable Singapore is as a jurisdiction for designing and building smarter markets. My interview with former U.S. Ambassador to Singapore, Frank Lavin, is coming up next. And now with this week's special guest, here's your host, Eric Townsend. Frank, thanks so much for joining us on Smarter Markets. It's great to have you on. I want to start with, uh, we like to, our tradition here is to start with a story from your life or career. Uh, How the heck does an American guy like you end up in Asia? Well, Eric, I ended up taking Chinese in college. I wanted to broaden myself. I thought in some part of my mind said, look, this might be useful. It might have some application. And uh, I had worked then in government. I worked in the Reagan White House, Davey, going back a few years. Reagan White House, National Security Council, State Department. I stayed on for that one term of President uh, Bush 41 at the Commerce Department running Asia operations. And then he lost re-election, you'll recall, in 92 to Bill Clinton. And uh, that was my first time out of government. I got an MBA. I said, I want to position myself in the market. I want to do something transactional, something business related. I've got Chinese skills. I've got very strong quantitative skills. And I went to work for Citibank in Hong Kong during the Clinton administration. And I had just a great time with uh, Citibank. And then I ended up going to Bank of America. I was the head of uh, Citibank for Energy Power, Chemical Pharmaceutical, and the Multinational Group for Asia. And for BA, I was the MNC co-head for all of Asia. And the Hong Kong job was Citibank, and the Singapore job was Bank of America. And then when uh, Bush 43 came in in 2000, he asked me to become ambassador to Singapore, so I went back into government. Well, Frank, I'm glad that we got you on the program because our listeners have been hearing since our first episode about Singapore. Robert Friedland talked about Singapore. We've had a lot of discussion. Some of our listeners heard my interview with Kyle Bass on the Macro Voices podcast where he said Singapore is really the emerging financial center in Asia. So for a lot of our listeners who do understand finance, but, you know, they kind of, Singapore, it's over in Asia. They, a lot of them know that there's some energy trading there. But, you know, give us the backstory. Singapore, what, what is it, what do we need to understand about this place? I'll tell you the good news, and there's a few elements of good news. One very important good news for people in North America is Singapore was established as a British colony. So it's British commercial code. English is the dominant language. 
So you can fly in there from the U.S. or Canada or any place, and you'll feel very much at home. I mean, it's it's uh, very tropical because it's right off the equator, and the uh, the majority population is uh, ethnic Chinese. So there, you know, right away there's some visual differences. But in terms of how business is done, all of the majors are there, all of the multinationals are there because it's a very user friendly environment. And uh, in terms of rule of law and commercial code, so one building block is that British heritage, British commercial code, and high degree of familiarity people are going to have with everyday life in that kind of environment. Another building block is. It so happened during my service, not that I did it, but during my time there is we negotiated and put into effect a free trade agreement. So there's a U.S.-Singapore free trade agreement, so zero tariffs, open regulatory system. So in terms of merchandise trade, it's one of the great markets for Americans. And the, the interesting, the secret sauce to that statement is it's a reasonably small population base, about 6 million people, meaning they don't have an embedded industrial base that a lot of other trading partners have. So they're quite open to products from other nations. And they make money from services and from being a regional hub, a finance hub, a transit hub, logistics hub. So they provide a lot of value to international economy, but they import a lot from the United States. They are typically, for the U.S., they're typically, say, the number 10 or number 12 market for American goods, really right around where France has. So a huge market And a place there's something like 20,000 Americans live and work in Singapore because of all that. Frank, something that Kyle Bass emphasized in his interview is the importance of an Asian city where there is an English language contract law legal system because you want to be able to have contracts enforced in a court of law in English. And of course, in Shanghai or something, you don't have that because you have to have your, your, your contract in Putonghua in order to, to enforce it. Does Singapore's legal system, is it dual language? Is it all English? How does it work? English is the dominant language, but if you do speak Chinese or Tamil or Bahasa Malay, you you can make your petitions in those languages. But English is the dominant language, and it is the language of the civil service and the government. And you're absolutely right. Your court proceedings are going to take place in English. And I might add to Kyle's point, per my previous comment, you're going to be able to pick that contract from your lawyer and read through it, and and it'll be 100% transparent and in your comfort zone because it's all drawn from British commercial code. Now, if you travel by ship into the port of Singapore, it kind of feels like the port of Houston, Texas. And what I mean by that is oil tanks everywhere. Now, in Houston, that's very easy to understand, Frank, because Houston, you know, that's where they do all all kinds of oil production. Of course, they got to have tanks to export it with. Um, Singapore doesn't have any oil production. Why do they have this major energy trading hub in Singapore Harbor? Yeah, they really built that out. I mean, is the short answer. They had they always had a very good port. And even today, even with all of mainland China coming on stream and you know, Shanghai and Shenzhen and Guangzhou and so forth, it's still something like number four, number five port in the world in terms of flow through. So so it's a great transit hub. And then once you have that kind of volume, you build out a warehouse infrastructure, a logistics infrastructure to support it. Well, it's only natural that somebody says, Why don't we also use this? for all all POL, all petroleum products, oil products as well. And remember where it sits, it sits at the very tip of the Malay Peninsula. So any ship that comes through from the Mideast to East Asia, to Japan, Korea, Taiwan, mainland China, has to go through those straits, the, the, the Straits of Malacca. So you're, you get enormous ship volume through that area. So it's not a bad place to put your warehouse or to put your tank farm. And they built out the largest oil depot outside of the Mideast, the largest take farm and storage area. And then they have a finance infrastructure that overlays that as well. That's, I mean, when you go back a hundred years, it was, everything was physical delivery. But in recent decades, of course, the financial dimension of physical delivery becomes more important than the physical product. And of course, as many of our listeners already know, in addition to the physical energy trading, it's also from a paper trading standpoint, probably the biggest energy trading center in Asia. From a standpoint of other commodities and equities and so forth, it hasn't been as big of a center, but it's emerging quickly. Tell us a little bit about the regulatory environment. They have something called MAS, which is the part of the government, which is is what the U.S. investors would think of as the SEC, the regulator that's in charge of everything. Uh, How is that organization organized? What's its reputation? How are they to deal with? Because certainly as a banker there, you've, you've had experience working with them. 
Yeah. Look, here's the point about Singapore. They don't have any cards to play in terms of natural resources. And they don't have any cards to play in terms of population base. They are a very small setup with no with no natural resources. So the one card they have to play is they have to make their country as inviting as possible a platform for economic activity. They have to make it the cleanest, most transparent, most well-run setup in the region. And I think they've done that. So uh, I mentioned a minute ago, the majors, you know, Procter & Gamble run all of Southeast Asia out of there. Ford Motor Company will put it set up there. Kellogg's is there. Pepsi is there. Coke's there. All of the majors run their operations out of Singapore, but the financial folks as well. Citibank has three or 4,000 people in Singapore, not just in its, in its full spectrum. It's retail banking operations with branch banking and teller windows, and it's also wholesale banking operations because they're supporting a corporate infrastructure. And it's also, as you suggest, a trading floor. And it's not just a trading floor because preferences and needs will be somewhat different than they might be in New York City, but it's also because you're playing the clock. You've got time zone because there's always somebody in the U.S. who says, I need to book this now, and New York is closed. But you say, we've got to run a 24-hour book. So you end up setting up parallel trading floors and parallel operations in Singapore with New York and with London and other markets so that you can serve that client on a 24-7 basis. Now, the specific thing I'd like to get to, Frank, is with respect to this podcast, uh, our charter here is Smarter Markets, envisioning what the future looks like, where people start to bring what in some cases are pretty radical technology changes to the table, innovative, creative ways to do things, for example, like tokenizing the entire commodity supply chain, replacing the paper systems of yesteryear with blockchain-based digital tokens. That is... If you're talking about financial regulation, that requires a regulator that is open to innovation, open to thinking outside of the box, not your your typical bureaucrat that's only willing to consider doing things the way they've been done for the last hundred years. How open is the Singaporean culture, but particularly MAS as a regulator, to working with companies that want to bring innovation to do things new in different ways, not following the mold of what's been done elsewhere? Eric, I I've got to say this. I give MAS very high marks in that regard. I give high marks in general just as a regulatory apparatus. So you have a clean bank environment. You know, they're as good as any, any regulator you'll find in the OECD. So, so you have a really nice banking operating environment. But what they've realized is nobody needs to get to Singapore. It's not a strategic market. So they've got to have a, an accommodating regulation philosophy. They've got to be able to tell fintech people, if you have an idea, bring your idea here and we'll work with you. We aren't going to be just passive. We're going to be iterative. You, you tell us what you're trying to do. We'll evaluate it. We'll get back to you. But if it makes any sense at all, if it's a legitimate commercial undertaking that's going to improve business processes, financial processes, we want to uh, entertain it, right? The only concerns they would have on the Singapore side is if it facilitates black market activity or tax evasion or something of that nature, right? But if you simply say, I have a better mechanism that will allow funds to be remitted internationally, Right, and we can really take those costs down with blockchain. Why should we be paying uh, even a single digit? Why should we be paying two or three percent commission and FX fees and so forth for remittances that are just very straightforward money wire transfers? Who can we use blockchain to drop that to zero or drop it ninety five percent in the cost? I bet we can. But MAS are the people you go to say here are some ideas on that. So, so I think they understand they've got to be the, the most open and friendly and thoughtful environment for fintech. Or else people are going to say, look, I can do this in New York City. I can do it in Silicon Valley. I can do it in London or Hong Kong. Why do I need to go to Singapore? So you really have a neat environment there. And then they, they build on that. They have a annual fintech festival and presentations and contests. So they're trying to create a culture of innovation, their own little sort of Silicon Valley lookalike, but only in the fintech space. And can I just tell you a little side story on that, Eric? Please do. They, 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 they had a very similar journey in pharmaceuticals and biotech because very similar sort of philosophy, meaning who's going to put their what, – what, which of the major pharmaceutical companies are going to put their lab and their tech activity in Singapore? Because you can put it any place. You can keep it in the U.S. You can put it uh, in any other market in Asia. You can put it in Europe to say, look, you're only going to put it in Singapore if 
if the regulators will work with you and are a friendly place because you, you might come up with a new diagnostic system, but you need to go through beta tests, you need to get in the hospitals, and you'll find that the regulators in Singapore will work with you on that because they want to be viewed as the most favorable, the most supportive. So we see, a, I, I've just seen it myself, both on the fintech side and on the biotech side, a regulatory environment where they realize that if they're the most inviting environment in the world, they're going to get the pharmaceutical majors and the biotech majors into Singapore, and they're doing it on the fintech side, and they're getting the fintech players in the market as well. I notice you've made several references to the fintech side, financial technology companies. What about growing their presence as a financial center, not just the, the tech companies, but in terms of exchanges and being the, the gateway city, if you will, to Asia, where Kyle Bass and other people have said Singapore is the emerging country there. And, and I think that something I'd like to better understand, I know that it, let's compare Singapore with Hong Kong. Hong Kong has historically been the center. Hong Kong, in terms of its independence, everybody's always known ever since 1997 that Hong Kong would eventually be absorbed into China. There was a, a, a treaty that uh, was supposed to take 50 years to do that. Now, as I understand it, Singapore is its own sovereign. It, it's not directly beholden to China. There is no plan for, for Singapore to eventually become part of China. So they have more independence. Is that correct? And if so, do they see, does the Singaporean government see themselves becoming the preeminent financial center in Asia, or do they want to focus on other things? Yeah, I think your premise is exactly right. Look, Hong Kong was always sovereign territory of China, and it was a question of when and how it would be absorbed under what circumstances, and that process is unfolding as we speak. Singapore has always been an independent nation, it always since it got independence as a, a British colony. It was a British colony, then independent, and it's a several-hour flight to Hong Kong from Singapore. So you're, you know, across the South China Sea. So it's a, it's a very different environment. The, old, the only real similarity is that both entities have a majority ethnic Chinese population. But that's that's sort of like saying two countries in Europe are similar because they're both populated by Europeans. I mean, it, it, you can have quite significant differences between uh, countries in Europe and you have quite significant differences between countries in Asia, but you do have sort of an ethnic similarity there. So there's some, you know, in terms of diet and, and food preferences and so forth, there are definitely some similarities. Uh, but your broader point, I think, is quite accurate that, and it's not necessarily Hong Kong related, I would just say that because Singapore runs a clean environment and because it is sort of the preferred financial capital of at least in Southeast Asia or broad, more broadly East Asia, they've just ridden that growth. And what they have in Singapore is extraordinary amount of human capital. So just take take some of the kind of regional examples. If you're a super regional Korean bank, you're going to put your regional operations in Singapore and you're going to have a, a Korean population there and you'll find Korean accountants there and you'll find Korean attorneys there and you'll find all the Korean multinationals will run their Southeast Asian operations out of there. And then you'll have a Korean primary school and a Korean secondary school there. So you say, this is just a great environment for us to manage our Southeast Asian operations out of it. It's a very friendly city. It's a safe, it's a green city and so forth. So, so you find that kind of cluster effect take place, but it's not just the Koreans, it's the French multinationals and the Germans and the Americans. So they really, they've really built a nice environment and it's a very welcoming environment for financial activity or corporate activity and it builds upon itself. So if you are the regional head of Procter & Gamble and you're running a 10 country operation out of Singapore and you say, I do have a, a legal issue or a tax issue in Thailand and I need to find somebody in Singapore who's a Thai tax attorney, you can find that person. So you've got just enormous human capital and problem solving capability across the whole region and it's all in one city. Now, from what I understand, there has been a big shift from physical manufacturing. Singapore used to be where most of the disk drives were, were made for yeah. computers. And th there was a, a lot of other industrial manufacturing, primarily, as I understood it, things similar to disk drives that were, you know, very high precision that required a... a sure, made, well, they made, made iPhones in Singapore. So, uh, yeah, at the upper end, upper end, upper end manufacturing was, could be competitive in Singapore. 
Now, maybe it's just that I've been learning more about the, uh, the the financial aspects. Is Singapore still growing with respect to physical manufacturing, or are they displacing that with more of what I'll call you know intellectual business? I, I think we're seeing in Singapore what we're seeing in all of the mature economies that the that it's far more competitive in the service sector than in the manufacturing sector. I think there's always going to be space for manufacturing. I mentioned before biotech and pharmaceuticals, and I know they do specialty metallurgy, uh, aircraft engine activity, and probably still a fair amount of tech activity in place. But my guess in terms of GDP, it's overwhelmingly on the service sector, logistics, finance, uh, air transit, and so forth, warehouse operations. Uh, the service industry is uh, got to be the dominant sector of the Singapore economy. Frank, we've been talking about a lot of positives, but you know, a lot of Americans have a perception of Singapore. The the Michael Fay case, which of course was the the teenage American who got in trouble for vandalizing cars in Singapore, and they have an extremely strict legal system there. Let's talk about what some of the negatives or perceived negatives are. I certainly know that, for example, uh, high-end real estate it used to be that Singapore was the second most expensive place after Hong Kong. Now I think it's surpassed it as the most expensive place. Let's start with the perception a lot of Americans have of this authoritarian government, which which is just seemingly very, very overbearing in terms of its punishment of crime. Let's start with the Michael Fay story, Frank, because that's one a lot of people have heard of. Sure. Uh, this is an American student in the early uh, 1990s in the Bill Clinton presidency who is arrested in Singapore. He's living in Singapore. He's in school in Singapore. His parents are separated, but his dad is working there. So he's he, that's where he's based. And he is arrested for vandalizing some cars with spray paint and also some traffic signs. And that's so far, that's sort of a normal story of bad behavior. But then what happens after that is the sentence that he gets is this is a sentence that Singapore still has on the books is that he is to be caned, which means he is to be struck on his backside with rattan, with bamboo type plant. And, uh, but it's a cane. It's a, you know, you're, you're kind of beaten and it leaves marks and you've got a sore backside and you, you're not you're not sleeping on your back for the next few nights right it's a it's a way of you know you could say on the positive side you're saying we don't want to incarcerate a teenager we think putting somebody in jail doesn't make them a better person and it can really mess them up but we don't want to just say well it's a hundred dollar fine we want to really let this person know what he did was unacceptable and let him give him something to think about. Now, for Americans, this is very shocking because we don't have corporal punishment. It's not a normal response. And so, and, and when this was first promulgated, Bill Clinton came out publicly against it and said it was a human rights abuse. However, interestingly, if you go, they were going back now a few years, but the public reaction in the U.S. was very supportive of the Singapore government. Because they said you've got a teenager who's vandalizing things, acting irresponsibly, and uh, you know you need to shut that down. And you, you you know again, everybody says, well, you don't want to put the guy in prison. There's no other mechanism to deal with him, so maybe this is the best outcome. So that did happen to the guy, uh, unfortunately for him. But the sentence was carried out. It did cause a bit of a rupture in U.S. Singapore relations for a few years because uh, Clinton is kind of. Now there's flag to the mast there on that uh, topic, but Singapore went ahead with it. And uh, it's a lesson. I think it is a lesson to say, look, if you are living and working in a foreign country, you are subject to that law of that country. So think about your actions. And there's something in some Americans' minds. Sometimes they go abroad and they say, well, now that I'm in Mexico or France or Singapore, I don't have to follow the laws. And drunk driving might be okay or shoplifting might be okay. And you've got to just think for a second. It's not okay. You, you need to have some common sense govern your behavior. Okay, so bottom line, Singapore still has uh, corporal punishment as part of their legal system, and it, it's a strict government. More broadly, how should we think about the Singaporean government generally? Well, look, I would say any country you might relocate to, you're going to have to be sensitive to local operating styles, and every culture and society is a little bit different, right? And for the most part, it's an easy adjustment, right? For the most part, you sort of figure it out. And I would say Singapore is well within that category. But but you ought to be aware of where it's, you know, there's some material differences. So the trend in the U.S. and I dare say Canada over the last decade has been 
take an increasingly uh, liberal view or permissive view toward uh, marijuana, for example. Singapore does not take a permissive view of that. Singapore takes a very serious view of that. They will expel you. They will punish you. And, and I would tell any foreigner visiting Singapore, be very careful about drug use and what might be perfectly legal, permissible in your country. It might not be legal in Singapore. So just spend a little time Googling that and uh, don't mess around with this stuff and don't just bring it in casually and you can mess up what should be a very positive very exciting uh, family experience in singapore uh, if you're messing around with drugs so i would just make that point right off the top but even you know in, in america we can have a very casual attitude toward uh, everyday laws if we don't see them sitting our purpose we don't mind cutting the corner sometimes and what i'm thinking of in this example is something like jaywalking you know, and every every American listening to this has probably been in some town and coming home from something at midnight and the street's completely empty and they just scoot across the street. I wouldn't do that in Singapore. They will ticket you, a policeman will stop you. You won't, you won't go to jail, you won't be caned. It's not it's not an abusive system, but they are, as you point out, they will they will take the legal code very seriously, more so than we do in the US. So so you just have to play by the rules and I wouldn't be in the habit of cutting corners. That's on the legal side. But I'll tell you, on an operational side, on the daily side, what you hear from the Americans, the two, the two biggest complaints you get from Americans in Singapore is, one, it is hot as the blazes because it's one or two degrees north of the equator. So it is right there in the middle of the tropics. So it is hot. And two, it is far away. It is not just a hop back home, but it can take uh, you know 15 hours or so to fly from Singapore to Los Angeles. So the idea that you know, sometimes if you're in London, you can get back to New York for a, a long weekend. It's not that bad. You can do it if you have to. You really can't do it from Singapore. It is far away. It is 12 or 13 or 15 time zones away, and you're right there on the equator. So those are those are the two biggest complaints you, uh, you'll you hear from Americans. But as I said, there are 20,000 Americans there. And once you adjust to that temperature, you say, you know what, it is a green city, it is a clean city, and it is a safe city. And the running joke of the Americans in Singapore is when they, you know, the school year's up and their kids are going back to the U.S. for the summer, and summer camp or see relatives or whatever. You have to coach your kids. You have to say, hey, guys, Cincinnati's not as safe as Singapore. So you have to be careful walking down the sidewalk and just be aware of where you're going. And, you know, you can't you can't have the freedom back in the U.S. that you had in Singapore to run around. So we would send our kids as grade school kids. You know, you take the bus by yourself. You run errands by yourself, go to the store by yourself with some money and buy the goods and so forth. But we had complete confidence that the place was a very clean, very safe city. And kids could run around without being on any kind of a leash. And uh, they wouldn't they wouldn't find a way to get into trouble. But here, here's one way to look at it, Eric. There's sort of a division between the commercial side of the law and the social side of the law. Commercial side of the law, contract enforcement, real estate leases, delivery of goods, trade, uh, trade law, and so forth, you'll find global norms. You'll be very comfortable with it. And I don't think you'll see any anomalies or twists or curveballs there. So that's just business law, so to speak. On the social side of it, what you see in Singapore is that society believes in more direct management of its citizenry than than we would normally do in the United States. So, for example, if you if you live close to your parents, you get a, a tax benefit, right? Meaning you you have a responsibility, as a Singapore citizen, to take care of elderly or aging parents, and parents can sue their children for non-financial support. So if there's an aging parent and uh, retired or doesn't have financial means, that parent is uh, does have the right to sue the child. And the child is obligated to pay for parental support. So there's roles that the society plays in Singapore that are really a bit different than what we would see in the United States. Well, I'll just share my own experience because I started with that American propaganda perspective of, you know, overbearing, overly authoritarian government. And I was very, very pleasantly surprised by my experience in Singapore. What I found in the way I think about this is in the United States, there has been a trend over the last 20 years of giving up freedom for the sake of security. 
And frankly, what we've done is given up a whole lot of freedom and liberty and gotten nothing as far as I'm concerned in terms of actual benefit. If you want to know what giving up a little bit of freedom in exchange for actually truly gaining security and benefit for giving up that freedom, Singapore is the the perfect role model place to see how that's done right. If you want to see a government that actually delivers more safety and security to its citizens in exchange for a little bit less liberty, Singapore actually delivers on that proposition. Let me build on your point, Eric, if I may just give you one example. This is kind of an interesting philosophical discussion, but as a as American, I'm always intrigued by this. U.S. has very broad freedom of speech. You can really sort of say anything about anybody. You can be pretty outrageous. You can say stuff that clearly isn't true. So you really have pretty broad right to say any darn thing you want to say. Singapore explicitly outlaws what we would call hate speech. You may not articulate any any speech that denigrates somebody on the basis of race or religion, ethnic background, and so forth, right? Whereas, of course, in the U.S., you can. And you say, you know what, that's an interesting approach. That is different than the American approach. You're right, you're giving something up in a sense, but you're saying, you know what, uh, at least nobody is going to get to a pulpit in Singapore and start trashing somebody, and they can get, you know, arrested or fined if they say something. And every once in a while it happens, you know, usually inadvertently, but somebody on a blog post or on social media, you know, rubbishes somebody and to say, well, you know, you can't, that's illegal in Singapore. So so it is interesting for America to come to terms with that, that uh, it's a society where that kind of hate speech just isn't permitted. Well, but there is actually a, a, a perceptible benefit to, I remember, I, I forget the name of the street, the, the downtown where where they have a, a very fancy uh, sort of promenade uh, area of shops. Well, Orchard Road, Orchard Road main exactly. shopping district. Yeah. I was on Orchard yeah. Road when they were doing construction there, and they've got these great big slabs of granite that would be perfect for making a custom kitchen with. And I know from having built custom kitchens, these slabs of granite are worth about six to $8,000 each. And they're on wheels, Frank. They're sitting on carts on wheels, and they're left overnight outside. So, Eric, did you did you grab one, Eric? No, I didn't, and neither did anyone else. <laughs> and that's the whole point, is they're not worried about somebody stealing them because nobody would take that risk. The, the, the criminal justice system yeah. is so strict that nobody steals anything. And along Orchard Road, there's all kinds of public art that's sculptures made of glass, Well, aren't they going to get vandalized? Isn't somebody, kid, going to throw a rock at them and shatter it? No, those things don't happen in Singapore. And so there really is an upside to that stricter system of government. But it is a stricter system. Every place you go, there's cameras in public everywhere. And, of course, that's true in the United States, too. It it used to be that Singapore had those cameras. The U.S. didn't. Now the U.S. has just as many cameras as Singapore does. We probably hide more of them. Singapore has them out in the open. Let's move on, though, to the downsides potentially. I know that Singapore is a very expensive jurisdiction to move into for manufacturing or something because the the cost of real estate is so high now. What are some, you know, we've talked about a lot of the regulatory upsides, the fact that they're very open to innovation. Are there any downsides that our listeners should understand about the economy there or the, the system of government and the business opportunity that exists in Singapore? It's an open environment. It's a very inviting environment. It is English speaking. It is based on commercial code. So I think in the in the main issues, it sort of ticks all the boxes of Mark Julian. But you're right. It is also an expensive environment. So you won't see mid tier manufacturing there. You'll see uh, mid tier meaning like auto parts. You'll see that typically in Thailand, right? Or you'll see the BPO activity in the Philippines, where there's an English speaking population. But if it's less skilled uh, set of activities like uh, airline reservations or hotel reservations, that activity tends to take place in the Philippines. So so there is a cost structure and a price structure in Singapore, and the work that takes place there has to be commensurate. But But what you get for that extra cost structure is you do get a very strong talent pool, and you get an infrastructure of finance and business leadership that is very high end in the upper you know, upper upper decile of capabilities. So you're you've got the right sort of audience and the right environment for your activity. 
Okay, so Singapore is not a place to go if you're looking for cheap labor, but if you're looking for qualified professionals in what is probably a, a fairly expensive economy to come into, it's very much a, an up-and-coming place. I wanted to start with Singapore, Frank, because I, I, you were the ambassador to Singapore. I figured that that's a very strong area of expertise. But you've been living in Asia and around Asia for decades. Let's broaden this a little more. Our charter here is to think about smarter markets, how to make financial markets better embrace technology and better serve society. Now, something I think you could say broadly about Asia is that it's a more welcoming culture in Asia to technology. This idea of having apps on our smartphones that do lots of things is, is obviously gained popularity everywhere on the planet. But it's kind of a new thing to Americans in the last few years. Asians have been paying for most stuff with their phones for well over a decade, probably two decades now. Tell us a little bit more. I mean, you've got lots of experience in Asia, but just broadly, if we think about how to make markets smarter, where are the opportunities that you can think of in Asia, and how does Asian culture differ from Western culture in its readiness to accept technologically enabled solutions to old problems? Yeah, I, it's extraordinary to me because it's only in the last few years, maybe 10 years, but it's it's two or three drivers here. It's this, it's this profusion of smartphones, so the enormous computing power and real-time information that takes place in your pocket, and then it's apps come on top of that where it's it's no longer that you need a special desktop computer or a laptop computer, but now there's trading apps that download on your phone and, and all, all banks move to online services and the complexity and practicality of those banking activities continues to build out. I mean, I'm old enough. I started with Citibank in Hong Kong in 96 and it was quite innovative to have phone banking that you could use a touchtone phone to find out your balance was considered kind of interesting that you didn't need to go to the bank branch. And now you're saying, look, you can do everything on that app. And not only can you do everything on that bank app, but because of the connectivity in the markets, you're now thinking of activities that even five years ago you couldn't do. So if you have a friend that says, you know what, there's this incredible equity play in France, but these folks are only listed on the Paris Bourse. You know, so if you want it, you've got to buy this stock in Paris. Well, people say that's not a problem. I can do that. I can do that right through my app. Whereas even five years ago, you couldn't do it. And you'd say, well, look, I'm not going to try to call somebody in France or I got to call my Merrill Lynch broker in New York and have him call somebody in France and then pay some odd commission. I mean, it's just too cumbersome to do this. So the point is your options now in equities are global with any market, any participation. And it's not just equities. Then it turns over to derivatives and forwards and futures and synthetics and it's extraordinary the amount of sophistication that the people you think wouldn't habitually invest in these kind of instruments are now you know quite comfortable with them and i'd say you know all, then then overlay that the the bloomberg and the cnbc and the amount of financial information out there and the specialized channels and you know if you if you say i want to i only want to follow one commodity instrument and that's it. My whole life is just around wheat or an energy instrument or something. The amount of specialized information and newsletters and blog traffic and commentary and and some of its subscription basis, but some of it's free that you'll find there's a ag economics professor in Nebraska who writes a daily blog about wheat and it's pretty good and it's free. And so all of a sudden, everybody's empowered to, everybody has the sort of same information and everybody's playing an active role in the market. Frank, if I tell our listeners that after being ambassador and having uh, worked in the banking sector in Asia, you know the business climate well there, and today you're in the import-export business, I bet 99.44% of our audience just drew a picture in their head saying, oh, they, they make all the stuff in Asia and it gets imported to the United States. Frank's in the business of importing you know, Chinese-made goods and selling them in the United States. You're actually in the opposite business, a business that I, I never really thought existed in any large scale of exporting U.S. manufactured product and selling it in Asia. How does that work? How big is that market? Why haven't we heard more about it? It is a huge market because of the booming middle class in Asia. And, and I think you'd say one of the laws that governs the success of American firms in this space is called the law of convergence, meaning 
consumer tastes around the world tend to converge if you hold even for income levels. That that a middle class person in Shanghai or Singapore or the U.S. will have very similar taste, and that's why there's these great global brands. So people like whether it's IKEA or Levi's or Nike or Crest, but these are these are the the American consumer who respects these brands is no different than the mainland Chinese consumer that respects these brands. And so no surprise, the global majors, the, the Coca-Colas of the world, the McDonald's of the world, do very well in China. What I tend to work with are sort of the next tier companies, the people that might have a very good brand, very nice product, but they don't have the management structure that's a globally capable at this point. So they have to find partners and allies and distributors who will help that out. And the other, so that's the starting point is what I just described, that we have great products, great brands in the United States, but don't always have global capabilities. The other side of that coin is what's emerged in China and most other major markets is the uh, rapid emergence of e-commerce. So now you can have a reasonably good national footprint, national distribution, purely as an e-commerce brand. And you don't have to say, I've got to find a distributor, I've got to have a warehouse, I've got to have trucks, I've got to have a personnel, I've got to have a logistics chief. So now you can sell into China without having a legal entity in China. You can sell in China without having any personnel in China. You can sell in China just having a pure play e-commerce operation there, and you're going to touch 50% of the market. Meaning, in the U.S., e-commerce is only about 25% of retail spend, but in China, it's about 50%. They're just more digitally oriented than the U.S. is. So that's not a bad starting point for a mid-tier U.S. brand to say, here's my chance to get into that market, and all I need is an e-commerce store. Now, help us understand the cultural side of this, because when I first moved to Asia in 2009, one of the things that I knew is, you know, having moving into Hong Kong, it's a place where they sell the knockoffs of everything. If you want to get very inexpensive, fake Louis Vuitton handbags or Rolex watches or whatever, uh, there's a place uh, on the north side of the the harbor where there's a whole building that just sells that kind of stuff. What I had no idea was... It's for tourists. It, it's for white guys. Asians won't touch the knockoff stuff. They don't want anything to do with it. They only want the genuine article. I would have assumed that, that Asians would be buying the, the cheap stuff that's, that, that they make. It doesn't work that way. What's going on there? How does this work? Yeah, Eric, yeah, that's a fascinating point. What happens when, you're, you know, when you hit that middle class status is those brands are meaningful. That authenticity is important. Sometimes it's a health issue like toothpaste. I mean, who wants a knockoff? Toothpaste, you want to make sure you want to make sure it's made by Procter and Gamble and you're getting the real stuff, right? And sometimes though it's uh you know just a quality issue to say, look, if I'm gonna lay out this kind of a money for a watch, I want it to be the real Rolex, right? And I'm not interested in the the knockoffs or the ripoffs. But that that might have been more appealing a few decades ago when you had just had less purchasing power, less education, and people were never gonna have a Rolex anyhow. So uh, I'll give you just one story on this. So the the main shopping platform in China, Tmall, it's part of Alibaba, Tmall, five letters, just T-M-A-L-L, requires, you can only sell on that platform if you are the brand or authorized agent, meaning Nike will have a nike.tmall.com store on it. That's the official Nike store in China is on Tmall. But if you and I come across some Nikes and say, I'd like to sell them, Tmall says you can't. You're not a Nike employee. You're not a Nike agent. You're just a guy who found some Nike shoes on the side of the road. So every product on the Tmall site is an authentic product. It's a validated product, right? So so because that's what the consumer wants. So increasingly, as you become affluent, as you become educated, you say, that brand has meaning. I don't want the knockoff and the ripoff and the weird, showy, glitzy, cheap stuff. I've got to have the genuine cosmetic product or the genuine apparel. So you have, a, I think, a very sophisticated customer base in China. And they're favoring non-Chinese made goods. This is something that surprised me living in Hong Kong. Is Well, here's, you know, yeah, here's, here's the other element. I mean, if you look, all of these markets we sell into in Europe or Japan, these are great markets, but all of them have incumbent apparel manufacturers. All of them have incumbent cosmetic manufacturers. All of them have incumbent processed food manufacturers. China, because of their history, doesn't have a, a premium product slate. They're building it out. I mean, they'll get there. But but if you want a, a very nice sweater as a gift for your wife, you're probably going to buy a foreign product. It might be from the U.S. or Japan or Europe, but it's probably not a domestic 
product yet because the manufacturers mainly focus on the middle part of the market, the value part of the market, because that's where most of the population is. And they leave the foreign manufacturers to focus on the premium segment, right? So, so you know, that's why Nike's pretty popular in China. Apple iPhones are pretty popular in China. Uh, Mercedes Benzes are popular in China. General Motors sells more Chevys in China than they sell in the United States. Well, Frank, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview. Before I let you go, for our listeners who may be interested in the work that you do exporting U.S. products to Asia, uh, how can people get a hold of you? Well, the company is Export Now, and the website, just one word, exportnow.com. I'd love to hear from you. I'm on LinkedIn. If people uh, are, are working in the U.S., we work with all retail brands, consumer goods, and we sell them into China online, run e-commerce stores. We can basically take any e-commerce store in the U.S. and replicate it and run it for you in China. And that's what we do for a living. And uh, divide my time between China and Singapore and the U.S. And I'd be delighted to connect with you. You're coming out this way when this when this pandemic is behind us a little bit in the coming months. People will be traveling again and we can sit down. Frank, thanks again for a terrific interview. We strive to make Smarter Markets a listener-driven program and always value your feedback. Some of our previous episodes have focused on designing smarter commodity markets, but some of you have asked us to broaden the conversation, to consider how stock markets could be made smarter and better serve market participants. So my guest next week will be Joss Schmidt, founder and CEO of Canadian stock exchange NEO. We'll discuss why Joss saw the need for another stock exchange, what he thinks is wrong with the way existing markets work, and some of the things NEO is doing to improve the market and level the playing field for all investors. That's coming up next week on Smarter Markets. Listeners, please help us get the word out about Smarter Markets. It's not every day you come across a podcast with guests on the caliber of Jeff Curry, Miriam Ayati, and Robert Friedland. And we have a veritable who's who of industry legends lined up for interviews in coming weeks. Your ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts and other podcast platforms mean the world to us, as does your help spreading the word about smarter markets via word of mouth. For the Macro Voices Podcast Network, I'm Eric Townsend. See you again next week for another installment of Smarter Markets. That concludes this week's episode of Smarter Markets. For free episode transcripts, visit smartermarketspod.com. Smarter Markets is 100% listener-driven, so please help more people discover the podcast by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. Smarter Markets is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Smarter Markets should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Smarter Markets are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Smarter Markets, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend and Abex Technologies, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Smarter Markets.